Um, so welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to the monthly ABIN webinar. Uh, this morning we have Dr. Jim Schuler with us and we are so excited to bring him in. Um, he has been presenting in Arkansas at a at a Meth Over Me conference, and so we are so glad that he is here with us today. Um, before formally introducing Dr. Schuler, I wanted to remind you that you staying on today's webinar, you are giving us your permission to record this webinar, and it will be posted to our website. So please know that. Um, we are so glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, next month in January, to kick off the new year, we will have Monica Harrison, and she is from the AIM Center. She will be speaking on the collaborative care model. And with that, we now want to introduce Dr. Jim Schuler. Dr. Schuler has lived in Colorado since age six, growing up in the court area. He attended Colorado Timberline Academy in Durango for high school, and after that became an MP in the United States. He then returned to Fort Collins, where he was employed a couple of years. Um, and then went to Colorado State, where he did a double major in botany and zoology. He attended medical school in Des Moines uh, University and received a master's in healthcare administration along with his doctorate in osteopathic medicine. He then attended an internship and in residency in emergency medicine at Michigan, Colorado, and has practiced emergency medicine in a wide variety of emergency departments, including locum tenens, work in multiple states and urgent care settings. Dr. Schuler's passion for addiction medicine arose from his own recovery from alcoholism over a decade ago. He began his training at Harmony Foundation and worked under and with several addiction medicine specialists in a variety of practices over the past nine years. He is currently dual board certified in addiction and emergency medicine with a subspecialty in wilderness medicine. He currently lives with his wife, in Lafayette, in Lafayette, Colorado, um, and uh, has some grown adult children. Additionally, he had he has been the medical director for Thriver Health, an outpatient SUD treatment in Inglewood, Colorado. He was recently in the medical director for Choice House Lookout in Boulder, Colorado, and he's been a regional medical director for Fort Range Clinics devoted to outpatient addiction treatment and currently works in the Denver Recovery Group, another outpatient opioid addiction treatment facility. And he has been the medical director for a couple of other OTPs. His, some of his hobbies are gourmet cooking, traveling as much as possible. He tells us he just got back from San Francisco yeah. and a variety of outdoor activities in Colorado. With that, we want to turn it over to Dr. Schuler. We're so pleased that you're here with us this morning. Well, Kim, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And uh, <clears throat> Jenny, I really appreciate the invitation to come and chat with your uh, group. I'm absolutely passionate about getting this word out about what addiction really is and what we can do about it. And this is sort of a two-part uh, series We'll talk a little bit about the science of addiction uh, today, what it really is, how it starts, how it works, and we'll talk about the stigma and some of the things that get in the way. That's what I was initially charged with. And then the next step is, what can we do about that? And since we only have an hour, I'll cover that first part uh, today, and then uh, hopefully you'll invite me back as I've got a whole second uh, hour on specifically what we can do. So without further ado, let's uh, get started. Everybody should be able to uh, see my screen if uh, so. All right, I'm seeing a head nod uh, there. This is my contact information at the bottom of the uh, screen. Please feel free. That's my uh, cell phone down there. Reach out and uh, give me a shout if you would uh, like or send me an email. Uh, I love all the questions and uh, I'm more than happy to help even though I'm another uh, state away. 
Uh, as Kim had mentioned, I'm dual board certified in both addiction uh, and uh, emergency medicine. And uh, I've also got fellowship training in uh, wilderness medicine. So even those questions aren't uh, too far uh, out, of, out of whack. Uh, I work in both the inpatient and the outpatient uh, realm of substance uh, use disorder through a company called Substance Use Disorder uh, Consultants, and we're available for expert witness services, speaking services, medical director uh, services, and the like. And uh, I consult with physicians on the phone to help with addiction care all the time. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. I'm not associated with any uh, drug companies or anything like that. The first thing we're going to talk about today is the stigma of, of addiction and the definition, uh, I want you to pay close attention to the underlying word there, of beliefs. It's a set of negative or unfair beliefs and listen to all of the um, terminology that, that says negative, uh, unfair, stigma, these are not factual things, although this is what happens in our brain. This is actually an attack upon other human beings. And of course, it's said about a society or a group of uh, people about anything. And it really is a mark or a, 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 of, of shame or discredit. Substance use disorder has been, since the dawn of time, equated with being a moral failing. Uh, people are substituting one drug for another when it comes to uh, treatment, and all this is stemmed from a lack of true knowledge of uh, what, this, what this is. Addiction in and of itself is multifactorial. At the very bottom of this, we can see that uh, these are all life stressor type things from neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, <clears throat> traumatic events, and these things all create uh, isolation, stress, fear, shame, guilt. That sets up the brain to look for coping, and the way we cope is listed in the above part of the tree through various food things, smartphones, video games, gambling, drugs, alcohol, etc. And uh, over on the left-hand side, there's a little box there that says, oh yeah, don't forget about genetics. There are multiple genetic factors that are involved, and this will become completely clear in a few minutes as we talk about how all of this uh, gets started uh, up, in the, up in the brain, and so we can see how complex this truly is. <clears throat> the experience of stigma itself is this experience of being deeply discredited. And if anyone has ever felt like that, we know that this is not good for moving forward in uh, life. The substance use disorder itself, which is the most politically correct way of saying uh, addiction, is the most stigmatized physical or behavioral condition anywhere in the world. And media rarely portrays people in recovery. Yeah, there are a few good movies out there. But um, the vast majority of people are being displayed in the active illness part and not what we have uh, done about it. 80% of the people on methadone, so this is just a single drug only for opioid use disorder, which is a very small sliver of the pie, a full 80% of them uh, reported the effects of stigma in uh, a well-controlled peer-reviewed study out there. 60% of those said that it affects their daily lives, not just once in a while. About half feel ashamed to actually be on this, right? <clears throat> if somebody said, well, gee, you were diagnosed with strep throat and you got put on penicillin, nobody would be saying, oh, it's the most awful thing in the world. I can't believe that I'm actually on penicillin. We just say, well, yeah, and you'll be over it and it'll all be fine, right? Or I can't believe I'm on hypertensive medication. This is the most terrible thing in the world. What will people think of me? Uh, most feel that a stigma affects their treatment. And oddly enough, family and friends have a greater amount of stigma than do healthcare workers, but a but a large majority of stigma arises right from healthcare work workers. 
Ninety percent uh, thought the public held negative beliefs about this, and they're right. About eighty percent uh, preferred abstinence base over what we see is called MMT or medical therapy for uh, addiction. And the same negative stereotypes of themselves come out and lend right into that belief. The terrible part about this with uh, the negative, um, uh, that negative perception of being on medication we'll see in just a little bit is a huge barrier to care in itself. And the result of that then often winds up, especially with opioids with death. <clears throat> this comes from so many sources. We have family members and friends. Our closest support system will do that. Healthcare providers are absolutely guilty. No question about coworkers and employers. Colorado is an at-will state. And right now I want to give a uh, shout out to the ADA uh, which is not the American Dental Association, but it is the <laughs> Americans with uh, Disabilities Act. And uh, you are not allowed to discriminate in the workplace uh, for race, creed, color, all of those things. But in that list is in uh, medical health conditions. If someone has been um, uh, had their job placed in jeopardy or lost a job because of the medical condition, uh, the ADA is the way to go through the state uh, uh, employment agency. They will begin the investigation, and the fines are actually very uh, heavy. Recovery organizations we'll talk about in a little bit. Even 12-step groups and sponsors are a major source of this. That would be the place where most people go for help, and that's the very place that has a uh, uh, is part of the stigma problem. Of course, treatment organizations are deeply involved in this. Uh, many organizations uh, say we have, we support just an abstinence uh, model and, and no medical uh, therapy. And of course, the criminal justice system uh, is uh, a a vocal way of the United States saying, you people are behaving poorly. You need to change your behavior and we're gonna keep punishing you until you change that uh, behavior, which we've been doing for thousands of years and it's not uh, working. The result is people are less likely to benefit from treatment if they get uh, into treatment. And I have a less likely, because this is what the research shows, <laughs> Uh, to benefit from punishment, but punishment actually puts people in the other direction, which adds more to the roots, more shame, guilt, etc., which causes the illness to uh, uh, express itself even more. So <clears throat> punishing this illness adds to this illness and makes it worse, the very thing that we as a society are trying to prevent. Uh, this uh, promotes long delays in seeking uh, treatment and prevents access to uh, treatment. So patients may let go of life-saving medications like naloxone, buprenorphine, methadone, etc. And uh, people who are in treatment often feel the shame of that, as we had uh, mentioned, uh, which minimizes their involvement so they don't look at themselves accurately and tend to stay stuck in this trap uh, even longer. Uh, and uh, it causes major problems with all kinds of ancillary services. Uh, if there are injection services, uh, syringe access, uh, et cetera. Further, um, this leads to judgment in other medical settings. So when you seek care for other things, you're judged primarily for this. Of course, uh, the friend and family relationships, dating is uh, impacted, low self-esteem, employment's impacted, referrals to treatment uh, become very unlikely. And interestingly, primary care physicians are less likely to refer for appropriate physical health services that are not related to SUD. So with coronary artery disease, they might just say, gosh, uh, you should probably be eating differently and making better choices in your life. Whereas if you, SUD is not involved, there might be a, geez, you need to see a cardiologist right away. Uh, <clears throat> of course, one of the things that overlies this, uh, this whole thing is that payment for services is dramatically uh, inadequate. We are making some good headroads uh, in Colorado 
through uh, groups uh, that are that are called the, uh, groups like what's what's called the Substance Use Advisory Group and the Co Colorado Consortium for uh, Opioids uh, uh, Disorder. <clears throat> and we actually can get in with our legislators and get them to create smart legislation. Those people that are legislating actually know nothing about this illness. And so they're more likely to just legislate more uh, punishment. And of course, friends and family who are uneducated and unaware tend to urge people into incorrect treatment based on beliefs, not uh, based on uh, facts. So the culmination of this is that we have reduced access to all kinds of services, housing, jobs, et cetera, while we're on uh, MAT. Oh, you can't be on that medication while you're here. Meanwhile, there's a host of uh, research out there that shows that there is zero interference with things like driving, fine motor skills, uh, et cetera. And uh, people, of course, are led to not talking about their treatment, so they don't get the support that they uh, need. Dosing tends to get uh, minimized. Services are not taken advantage of when they are uh, um, uh, present. And subsequently, most people never even seek treatment, and we'll see that uh, fairly shortly here. <clears throat> so in if and then if we go to an already marginalized group like someone is Hispanic or black or they come from a d different religious uh, background or female uh, pregnant women uh, especially that narrows the scope even farther uh, uh, down. And when these people do go for a safe haven, like a recovery group, hey, the 12 step meetings, that should be a good safe haven. Actually, we get a ton of conflicting messages uh, from there. The official membership states the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using. And even in a 1996 pamphlet, uh, Narcotics Anonymous uh, has the right to limit uh, such members uh, participation in meeting, no sharing, no service positions, no sponsoring, uh, et cetera. How, how horrible is this? You get the very help that you need. And now when you go to a support group, you can't uh, get that. So these things are uh, rarely enforced, but sharing about medication assisted therapy uh, is usually highly discouraged. And uh, I've had personal experience of many people who have said, hey, doc, my sponsor is telling me that this is a mind altering medication. So I'm not really in recovery. And uh, that's the whole subject of, of, of another lecture <clears throat> about medication assisted therapy and how it really works. Uh, the bottom line is that our minds are where addiction is, and we'll see this in just a moment. And to reorder those pathways to the best of the ability of medical research is the goal of this, to get people back into productive and useful lives, just like we would with any medical condition. And it's not mind altering with the goal of having your mind altered so you can disappear from uh, existence. <clears throat> the ways that we can combat this are through, as I had mentioned, like substance use advisory groups and professional groups like this. We can have uh, policy and advocacy and legal avenues to do this. One of the most important methods is what I'm doing with you right now, professional education. Uh, and we can do all this through people that provide jobs to educate them, uh, people that provide housing and to our legislators. You know, interestingly, when you have somebody who's in recovery, they're a known quantity. And if a problem happens, you can say, yes, I know what the problem might be with this person. When you hire somebody without substance use disorder, they have an equal chance of having sub substance use disorder and just undiscovered at this point. So you have no idea what you're facing, right? So actually the trend should be to hire somebody in recovery because they've already got a support group and they're a known quantity. If something happens, all you gotta do is say, hey, let's do a drug and alcohol test, right? 
Whereas when you have someone that doesn't have substance use disorder declared and you say, gosh, their, their behavior is a little bit on the unusual side, you have no idea what's happening. <clears throat> Most importantly, the criminal justice system needs to stop punishing this illness and funnel people through, uh, through like the drug court system into getting help. And even with healthcare providers, this is where I really come in speaking with uh, healthcare providers to share the actual education with them, how to do this and what can be done about this and when to seek specialist help. The big thing that we are facing is when we take a look at other medicine on the left, this is what the medical suite looks like when it comes to addiction medicine. This is where we are. There's been relatively little in the way of uh, research done compared to other medicine as there's relatively little money. Only in the past uh, 10 years with the opioid epidemic have we really had a thrust with major money coming in. Oddly, the Society of Addiction Medicine, where I am a member, uh, the Society of Addiction Medicine has been in since the 1950s. Even the American Medical Association said addiction, oh, that's not a thing, that's just bad behavior. <laughs> After all the research over the past 50 years has come out, actually 70 years now, about 10 years ago, the American Board of Medical Specialties came to us and said, hey, addiction's a real thing. How come you guys aren't part of us? And we said, we tried back in 1958 and you wouldn't let us in. Oh, well. So on to exactly what uh, addiction is and uh, to, 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 to briefly preface this, the brain has three basic parts to it, and we'll get to that in just a, a moment. That's the hardware that tells the rest of our body what to do. Quite simply, substance use disorder or addiction is the software or malware program that is running on a perfectly operating hardware system. This is a neurobiologically based illness that expresses itself through what our brain does, thoughts and behavior. And this is a maladaptive learned response that's programmed by the survival center in our brain. Now, the definition of this is rather long-winded, and this is the, air quotes, short definition from the Society of uh, Addiction Medicine. Addiction is a primary chronic disease of the brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. I'm not going to read through the rest of this. The most important thing to illustrate is that this is a chronic disease. And through all kinds of imaging studies and everything else that we have now, there's incontrovertible proof that this is the way this is. The brains are simply wired differently, just like someone with coronary artery disease is wired to have their arteries clogged up. <clears throat> Those with substance use disorder are wired to have their brains working in a maladaptive uh, pattern. So addiction is characterized by this inability to consistently stay away from those drugs of choice. How do you know you have this thing? These are straight out of the DSM. These are the criteria for addiction. It's quite simply, do you have a yes or a no to any of these uh, 11 criteria? For instance, the first one is taking the substance in larger amounts or for longer than you meant to. Well, yeah, I don't seem to be able to. Have you ever tried to cut down or wanted to stop, but you found that you couldn't, right? If you have just two to three of these characteristics, you would have what we would call mild substance use disorder. Four to five is moderate. More than six is the most severe form. <clears throat> when I take a look at my own addiction situation with uh, alcohol, as was first mentioned in the opener, I could answer, oh, hell yeah, or all day, every day to all 11 of those. And subsequently, anybody with the most severe form often truly warrants inpatient treatment. 
If you have mild pneumonia, maybe just an inhaler and some antibiotics would treat that as an outpatient. If you have severe pneumonia, you may be in the intensive care unit on a ventilator with all kinds of support trying to save your life. And that is the appropriate way of treating this. As the severity goes up, we step up our function. But as you know, there are so many barriers uh, that are involved to uh, treatment. So keep this in mind, keep this at hand. And when you have two to three of these, think mild, moderate, or severe, and please help people get into the support that they need. All right. How this is actually happening, this goes right to that, uh, what's called the triune or three-part uh, brain. In brown around the outside, cortex means covering. That's the supercomputer that's the uh, human brain. And then I prefer to call it the limbic area since emotional parts and memory parts, they just come up all the time and there's no particular control for that. That's the emotional brain. That's the type brain that... Uh, most mammals uh, have without the benefit of the supercomputer that we do. And then what's affectionately referred to as the reptilian complex is that instinctual brain tells you when you're hungry, when it's time to poop, when you're safe, when you're not. <clears throat> and how all this developed itself or began is very simple to see <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the illustration of the worm. Let me direct your attention to the bottom left. This is a, a standard worm, as we might see after the uh, the rain. The first parts that you see in the red, that's how uh, the heart <coughs> in the, uh, the worm has developed. And interestingly, that particular heart is what has later turned into our heart. Up in the upper right, you can see what's called the cerebral ganglia. That cerebral ganglia is actually the worm's brain, and it works very much on the same neurotransmitters that ours do. Ours do. You can see there are three main neurotransmitters in the uh, in the worm's brain: dopamine in the lower right uh, 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 part here. Uh, is being uh, pointed at by the red arrow. Right next to that, you can see serotonin and then acetylcholine. Essentially, we found three neurotransmitters and dopamine is the driver in the worm brain for what the worm does when it comes to control of food, uh, uh, safety, reproduction, etc. Dopamine is the currency that tells us what's next for survival. And in the far upper uh, left, <clears throat> we have what are called bilateral creatures, meaning they are the same on the right uh, and, and the left. And developmentally, we can see all the way from the very simplest uh, brachiopods right up to the vertebrates where we are included and we watch this development of time. And there really is no other way a biological system can work. We get a natural selection, as Darwin was fond of uh, pointing out to us, that if we get a genetic mistake and something new gets created, if it's a survival advantage, it perpetuates itself. If not, we don't have it. So the interesting thing is what this has led to is how the brain functions. At the top of this, and I'm sorry for the way this copy came out, I just didn't look at that until this morning and I'll clean that up for the next time I do this. But we get some sort of sensory input that goes to the lowest part of the brain, which is next, that's the thalamus. That relays things to where they need to go up to the uh, brain. The next part is, should we be worried about this? And that's where the amygdala comes in. It tells us what the importance of this uh, input is. <laughs> and then that lower brain center, excuse me, <laughs> goes up to the supercomputer in a very strong link and tells it what to do. Yes, that's that very super smart part of our brain can feed down, but that's where the weak link is. And what is probably impossible for you to see are the two red boxes on the left and the right is the timing of this. It takes about a quarter of uh, a second for it to get from the thalamus up to the am amygdala and then from the amygdala into the neocortex. Well, think about what can happen in a half a second in your brain. 
and you can solve the problems of the universe within there. So we are stuck with the only way our brain can work. It's a bottom-up processing model. The older parts of the brain are fastest and more efficient. The newer parts of the brain, the human brain, are far slower. So this is a terrible design when you think about it. But it's the only one biologically available. So let's focus on this reward center. It's the worm brain. It's the part of the brain that powers all of us. And it's there to tell us some very basic things. It doesn't think per se. It just sends impulses up that tell us how to maintain hydration, make sure we have adequate food and nutrition, make sure that we have shelter from the cold and heat, and ensure that we are safe and preserve ourselves and, and higher up animals that has extended to safety for the tribe or the family. Of course, it drives us to engage in sexual uh, reproduction because if we didn't do that, the species couldn't uh, exist. And then in higher up animals, there's also a nurturing or protection of the, the young. Where this all happens, there's a dopamine factory on the far left-hand side that's called the ventral tegmental area. Well, ventral just means your belly surface. Tegment means covering. So I have renamed that the survival center. And then it relays on up to a higher center, the nucleus accumbens, to tell us what the importance of that is, to say, hey, we've got a really important survival message here. And then it goes on to the prefrontal cortex and other parts of the brain. In the middle, you can see a feedback pathway where um, glutamate, dopamine, and uh, the, uh, uh, the breaks on the brain are all located together in this fine balancing pathway. And we'll come to that more uh, in, the, in, in a slide or two. Most important thing to remember is that all of these are centered in the most primordial part of our brain, not the thinking part of our brain. They relay later there. Then on the far right-hand side is just to show you other centers like blood pressure control, respiratory centers. They're all located in the very same uh, part and where you see where it says eating behavior, that's up in the survival area at the very, very top of this, the most original and primordial brain. Now, to get into a substance, you have to like something. We talked initially about this dopamine pathway here, but that's not the like it center. As it turns out, liking something is very, very complex. <laughs> serotonin is involved in that, uh, that uh, and serotonin is incredibly important in our diet. Uh, that tells us what feels good. Additionally, oxy, uh, oxytocin has been called the love hormone. When that gets released, uh, that's involved in uh, uh, child rearing, sexual reproduction, uh, lactation. Uh, so both serotonin and oxytocin are involved. And if you look at the bottom right, it says endorphins. Wait a minute, endorphins, that's the body's chemical endogenous morphine, which already tells us, hey, maybe there will be an alert for morphine being involved uh, in this. And uh, that system tells us we've done the right thing for survival along with dopamine. So we have multiple neurotransmitters that are involved in this pathway. And the illustration on the right just tells us, hey, We've got both dopamine and serotonin, and they follow in very, very similar pathways coming from some of the most root survival areas in our brain, and so they are intimately wired together. When that system goes awry, if we take a look at the normal system up above, it's a complex interplay of many different areas that tell us <clears throat> when something has been enough for us. And in that bottom uh, depiction, there is an imbalance there of what normally should happen. Some areas of the brain, that wiring simply goes away. Other areas that should exert more of an influence don't. And that's how we get uh, uh, 
And that's how we get out of whack. We'll we'll delve into this in, in uh, just a further moment to show you the complications that happen when we come up with this. This is the most simple um, uh, illustration of the control system in the brain. And so this is actually not it. What that might look like for food, if I were to say, hey, can I take you out to lunch in the process of you saying, yes, you have to first register in your body that you are hungry, which means empty stomach and you're borrowing nutrients. And then you have to do all the things that are motivated to going and getting lunch. When we're actually sitting down at lunch, <clears throat> this is the process uh, that happens. When we get involved, multiple chemicals get going, feeds back to the reward system, gets into a balance system, gets into our cognition system. Chemicals get involved, neurotransmitters uh, get uh, involved. Uh, to create balance here. When we have addiction, we get feedback loops that actually get interrupted here and those no longer work and the whole system gets thrown out of balance. We can see this when we uh, image things. We have healthy controls uh, on the far left-hand side here and this measures blood circulation and these are the two horns of the thalamic region of the brain which controls and relays things and where we see someone who's been into long-term drugs at the right part of that, you can see that there's far less circulation in that area. The photo on the right is merely uh, comparing a normal heart in the bottom left with a heart that has poor circulation on the right. And the same thing happens with the healthy brain above and the brain of somebody with uh, addiction next to that. We can see this in every single case, all of those common uh, addiction things on the, the left-hand photograph. We can see smoker, alcoholic, obesity, cocaine. Every single one of those has a reduced amount of circulation in those main processing centers. And the cool part is, is if we take a look at the healthy com control to the left on the right photograph there, and we take a look at someone who's in the throes of, uh, of addiction with reduced circulation. After just a month, their circulation begins to come back. And uh, 14 months or a little over a year, we can see that their circulation in the middle part of the brain is almost normal. What's interesting about this is when you take a look, you say, yeah, but I can see what looks like, well, frankly, Jim, Swiss cheese over on the right-hand side. And that's right. Those are areas of the brain that have died from the methamphetamine use, and we can't replace dead neurons. So get ready for it. Here's how all this really works. Okay, there'll be a test tomorrow on this. This is the basic feedback mechanism of addiction. Over on the left-hand side is the pictorial view showing you how these different parts of the brain all interact. Now, we all know those different parts of the brain have different communicators like a dopamine, uh, corticotropic releasing factor, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, ah, geez, all these names. <clears throat> the right-hand side of this shows how all those areas of the brain interact. So when it comes to looking for a drug to help us, this mess on the right is where we are. How terrible is that? Because if you think, well, gosh, I've got a drug that I'm going to put right into this place. I know exactly what that affects. Oh, yeah, it's going to have an effect on everything else. And so when it comes to drugs, the best thing that we can do is get drugs that help balance this system and work at multiple places. Well, those are very difficult to design. And at the very, very bottom of this, you can see the little red circle. That's where the uh, ventral tegmental area or the survival uh, center is at the base of all of this. So, geez. This is the real challenge, and this is why it has taken us so long to get where we are to today. It's taken us a great deal of technology, and interestingly, if you look at that on the, the left, those are just areas of the brain and how they interconnect. What about the individual circuits? Well, it takes so much computing power. That's where we are today, is to look at the individual circuits of the brain. Okay, so let's talk about specifically, as we apply this to the brain, how does this actually uh, work? <clears throat> uh, 
if we look at the very best food, best sex, et cetera, this is sort of that normal dopamine level of 100. And those release levels approaching 200 to give us that reward of dopamine that says, hey, this great food is really good for your survival. Hey, this great sex is not only good for your survival, but good sur for survival of the uh, species in and of itself. Interestingly, if we take a look, cocaine, opioids, heroin, and methamphetamine release levels much, much higher than <clears throat> great food or great sex in people that have uh, substance use uh, disorder here. So when you compare those, why would somebody ever go back and rely on good food, good shelter, good relationships when something like cocaine or opioids is far better for their survival? At least that's the message that their brain is telling them. And that's where the malware comes in. Now, how many people does this happen to? Well, if we take a look. <laughs> Overall in the population on the left-hand side of this, this is a little over 11% of the population that have ever reported having a problem. This comes straight out of SAMHSA, uh, and, and this is a self-report. Inherently, there will be minimization there, so that's a smaller part of the pie at 11% that you see is the part that tells us we have at least that amount in the population. And when you look at other studies, probably as high as 20% actually. And then the number of people that are actually getting help, about a quarter, meaning we have three quarters of untreated uh, illness. The way the process works is very simple on the left. You get some sort of an initial use that turns into sporadic intermittent use. And during this period of time, we're programming the brain, we get into regular use and then addiction develops. What is really involved is what's located on the right. And again, this is not necessarily what's happening in the brain, but since our brain has so many different parts, this is the result of what is happening. In other words, those behavioral manifestations that we see. And looking at this, let's not forget what's down below. Are there genetic factors involved? Early life stressors, um, uh, pre and postnatal drug exposure. Uh, what about the differences in sex between people, let alone all the other cascades that are happening in the brain above that? Jeez. So this is the most complex involvement in the brain of mental illness. <clears throat> and so I would encourage everybody here to look at this as the brain is having <clears throat> multiple parts that are not functioning in perfect coordination, which leads to an imbalance. This is what the receiver is experiencing. And so it's not really what is the matter with you or what is wrong with you, but what happened to you and how can we sort out these pathways? Now, the very basis of addiction and how the addiction attack occurs, I'm going to illustrate for you uh, and, and sort of tie together all of these uh, big messes that, I, that, I've, that I've put out. So there is an initial hijack of the brain. That was the part that we saw on the left. We get this pleasure euphoria that tells us this is the best thing that's ever happened for our survival. So our normal rewards begin to fade in importance, right? Uh, reproduction, food, shelter, uh, interconnection with other people, relationships become less important than what that survival command center is telling us. The next part is it redirects that motivation to ensure its own survival, right? So our very supportive circuits, our attention circuits and our focus circuits get us into what we call the seeking behavior to find more of that because it's necessary for my survival. Well, we need to learn and memorize and get feelings about those things so that we can remember where to get that supply later. So that gets redirected and our learning becomes optimized, not for positive things in life, but for the very drug 
itself. <clears throat> to ensure the continued use, this learning all happens at a subconscious level. It's not like we're sitting here looking at a multiplication table and having to memorize these things. This all happens in the operator uh, circuit of our brain. Every other learning thing in life is relegated to some lower level. Uh, <clears throat> and so the top priority becomes that drug in and of itself. <clears throat> As we start getting other inputs, people saying, hey, you may want to slow down. Are you aware of what you did last night? Are you okay? Behavior. The brain recognizes this and in order to survive, tries to hide this behavior. Of course, we have to hide it from self and hide it from others. So the very basis of the individual with addictions reality actually changes. So this is a virus running in the brain, operating in stealth mode, telling us we can't survive without this at the most powerful level of our brain. And so what shows up is all these justifications for not using, not stopping, that <laughs> the unaffected person or the person that doesn't have substance use disorder looks at it and goes, my God, that's crazy. Whereas the individual with it is actually in a belief system that they can't survive without that. So the addict brain has many, many dirty tricks. Interestingly, the go for it or that impulse control center has less and less and less control as time goes on. This then means that relapse becomes inevitable. Use patterns are actually hardwired in and you keep getting the opposite of what you're looking for as the user, meaning that this drug stops working. Well, what then? We lose ourselves. Uh, we give up and accept that we have become our addiction. We become shameful. You know, I, I've I've heard this moniker to begin with, and when it came out, I just I, I guffawed. You know, they said, "Oh, are you practicing trauma informed care?" Look at this illness itself. We become shameful. We are not sick. There is nobody with addiction that doesn't have trauma, he, having the illness in and of itself and society pointing a, at us being stupid, bad and wrong gives us all the trauma that we need to begin with. And then many other traumatic events may have happened. So forget trauma informed care. Everyone has trauma. So we need to be fixing that. Of course, <clears throat> Along with that, we lose our complete sense of values, which further adds to the shameful and the sickness uh, part of this. And as the uh, uh, as this illness progresses, uh, uh, the illness operates in the background and will always operate in the background. So even in a period of abstinence, not putting that drug in our system that's still working. I've been in long-term recovery for way over a decade now, but that is still operating in my brain, right? When I walk into a restaurant with my wife, with my motivation being to put food in my stomach because I'm hungry, we walk past the bar. Now, my wife is not an idiot. She has a PhD, she walks past the bar too, but something very different happens to her. She just recognizes the fact that it's a bar. I, on the other hand, see this beautiful thing up in lights. It looks supremely attractive to me and every bottle is talking to me. <laughs> this all happens in a flash of a second, but it still happens. Then as we sit down at the table, someone walks up and says, hey, geez, 10 minutes left in happy hour. We have a two for one special. <clears throat> Would anyone care for an alcoholic beverage? When my wife is making that decision, she is making a chocolate vanilla decision because she doesn't care. My first impulse is Coming out of my survival center, you can't survive without that drink. You must have that. Well, would bad feelings or bad memories about that 
uh, about that substance? Help me get a drink? Of course not. So my survival center goes up to the memory center and immediately quashes any bad memories that I have and tries to bring out good memories. Then it goes up to the feeling center. Any bad or negative feelings I might have about a, a drug or substance, those feelings get quashed and it brings up those feelings of the days of old of how much fun it was. Then it goes up to my processing center and gets me into an area where I am trying to convince myself to use. Oh, it has been such a long time. Hey, you'll have just one. Look, your wife is with you. She'll help keep you accountable, right? And then my recovery center has to kick in and say, wait, 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 wait. Remember that last time you grabbed a drink and you drank around the clock, you lost your house, you lost your wife, you lost everything, and you drank around the clock, begging for death in the most miserable place you were ever uh, at before. This will happen again, only it will be faster and worse because that's what naturally happens with addiction. Okay, so then I've learned I need to pick an alternative. So even with me, well over a decade in sobriety, that addiction wheel is still turning in there. And every minute of every day is a conscious effort. Well practiced, yes, but a conscious effort to pick something else up. And so we have to learn our alter alternatives. Why? Because there simply is nothing better available right now. So to summarize this, what we've got <clears throat> is the, the big sentence is this is a maladaptive, meaning addiction is not good for us. It will take us down into death. It's a primitive drive to consume chemicals or behaviors combined with all the learning, brain adjustment, and reality distortion needed. What this really is is a newly engineered artificial instinct within the brain and it hijacks our primitive control centers and sets up its own learning and it operates in a stealth mode just like a computer virus bent in its own survival and that's for life that's just the way we're wired once we come to the acceptance of that that neutralizes it right so for the next time, what we'll talk about is a deeper dive into the specific neurobiology, uh, how each drug itself causes addiction, and then subsequently what we can do about uh, these uh, various classes of drugs. Opioids are a little different from alcohol, which is a little different from the stimulants, which is a little different from uh, um uh, THC, which is uh, different from nicotine, how we can intervene with all those in both a clinical sense and a medical sense. All right, that saves us a few uh, moments for uh, questions. Uh, again, my contact uh, information up here. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to uh, field those. And thank you very much for listening to my dribbling on. Uh, Dr. Schiller, I just want to say before we open it up for questions, I just want to say thank you so much for this presentation. This has been phenomenal. Somebody like me as a clinical person that treats patients, I, I, you know, you think you know, you think you know everything or a lot of it. And you think you're you're well educated. And then someone comes along and says, hey, you, you don't know half of it. <laughs> and there is so much information in here that is so beneficial and and. Your comment about our justice system, you know, my husband is the drug court officer for our one of our counties out here, and I'm fixing to send this to his team. Um, I think this will be extremely beneficial. So just want to say thank you um, for just presenting this in such a digestible way for us. Um, Absolutely. I am gonna... you're, you're welcome. And this is my passion. You're Of course, I'm happy to, uh, we can figure out Dropbox or whatever. I can get you these uh, slides. I just want people to have this uh, information. There's nothing proprietary uh, uh, here, and I'm happy to give this talk elsewhere as well, if it would help anywhere within the criminal justice, law enforcement, employer uh, situation, etc. It's always better live rather than Zoom, uh, so I'm happy to come out as well. Thank you. Thank you. And and we should, just for everyone listening, this will be up on our website. Um, 
within a couple of days. So if there's something um, you want to rewatch, you want to share with others that will be available. Um, it looks like uh, Harry has a question in the chat. He asks, are we becoming a more addictive society that in the past than in the past? And why is that so? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you very much. And uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, all you have to do is read Dopamine Nation. We are, and it's an excellent read, by the way, we're naturally wired that way, right? <laughs> in other words, if somebody puts a food in front of you that you have never had before, how do you know if it's good for your survival? Your brain has to be able to learn and adapt. And about 20% of people are able to overlearn or over adapt in those areas and get a, an errant program. And by the time we look at all uh, behavioral, uh, chemical, et cetera, what we would call addictions, that is right around 20% of the, uh, the population. And always keep in mind, once you have one mental illness, what's your chance of having another? 88, zero percent. So by definition, if you're seeing somebody with substance use disorder, there's an 80 percent chance they have another underlying mental health disorder. Maybe it's bipolar. Maybe it's ADHD. Who knows? Uh, verbal questions are welcome, too. Feel free to come off mute and ask Dr. Shuley questions. I don't think he'll bite, so <laughs> I think you're welcome to do so. Let's give it another minute or so in case anybody's typing in. You mentioned, uh, you know, underlying issues could be ADD, ADHD. Do you believe that that is more do you believe that, that is becoming more of a common problem or that it has always been an underlying undiagnosed issue? That uh, it's not becoming more of a problem. And actually, there is a huge amount of research on that. Uh, if you have underlying ADD, ADHD, and I don't just say, oh, you're having trouble focusing. Mm, you must have ADD. Here, have a stimulant. Uh, that's uh, not an appropriate way to treat that because lots of things can cause focus problems, right? A recent trauma could cause a focus problem. Depression can cause a focus problem. Bipolar can cause a focus problem, right? ADD can cause a focus problem. Being distracted, poor sleep, those can cause focus problems, right? And so I always like to get an objective test uh, like the TOVA or there are several others out there to back up all the collateral information. But here's the interesting thing. If you have the diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, and you really have it, you are three or four times more likely to have a concomitant substance use disorder. And when you think about it, we talked about impulsivity being part of this. Well, wait a minute, aren't the people with ADD more impulsive? Oh, yeah. So you have set yourself up on the risk stratification pool to predispose yourself for substance use disorder. <clears throat> so whenever I go into my group lectures and I'm talking to people with uh, substance use disorder and I say, hey, put up your hand if you've ever been diagnosed with or pretty sure you have ADD, about half the hands will go up whereas we know that it's only 7% of the general population. So that's another thing you say, well, gosh, I'm always used to putting stimulants on board because they're so effective. Yeah, in this group, they're going to abuse them. So we have to find uh, uh, non-stimulant uh, strategies uh, for this group to treat uh, ADHD. I hope that uh, answers that question for you. That's the subject of the whole another lecture. Yeah. I, uh, my background is working uh, within a prison and a large population of that prison was there for meth addiction. And a lot of them actually started on ADHD medication. And when they could not get that, it progressed further. So that was. And that is what is supposed to happen. Right. And of course, we think, OK, now we're going to punish you. That will make things uh, better. Uh, the answer to that is no, it only makes things worse. So as a society, we're doing things the wrong way. Thank you.
we are almost at time. I'm going to go ahead and take one more question from the chat. This comes from Kim. She's asking, does this also apply to addictions to video games and social media platforms? Absolutely, it does. Those also release dopamine and uh, <clears throat> games are very carefully designed uh, with departments of psychology behind them to give that dopamine reward. And so we're seeing that uh, internet game. There's a whole nother DSM uh, uh, revised uh, area that is all set up about a diagnosis of internet gaming, uh, et cetera. Anything that can release dopamine, you know, you'll say, what about this new drug? They call it methamphetamine. Could that be? Absolutely. You know, as long as we invent new ways, we'll be able to tickle that system. We're just taking the same system and uh, putting, uh, getting it to behave again that way. Well, I just I just want to say thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Um, it has, it's been great having you on, talking with us and answering our questions. Um, for those of you who are wanting to rewatch or share this, just keep an eye on our um, our website, which I have put into the chat. That'll have uh, the webinar up on that site, and we actually have access to the rest of our webinars uh, on there as long, as well as any other educational opportunities that we've uh, we've provided. So, thank you guys for being with us. It's now a minute after, and your time is precious. So, I'm going to let you go. Uh, and it was good right. to see you, Dr. Schuler. Take care, all, and uh, I'd love to come back and continue this chat with specifically what we can do about it. Thank you for your time and attention.